So looking at number seven from exam one, 2014. I'm going to ask you to rank the molecules from least, from most reactive being one to least reactive five towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. So we'll see all the molecules. We'll draw them out. Okay, so I want you to rank from most reactive. So most reactive is one, and least will be five towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. So what are we basically looking at here? We need to look at the Activator activators and deactivators, right? What is each group on there? All right, so chlorine is a deactivator. deactivator. Good. This kind of ester-looking thing, what's that? Going to be an activator or deactivator? It's going to be an activator, right? The lone pairs on this oxygen are next to benzene ring, so it's going to be an activator. The phenol with the OH, what's that going to be? Activator. activator. Benzene's kind of just neutral. And then an isopropyl group like this is going to be an activator or deactivator. Activator. All right. So now the question is, Right, we have to essentially to rank these towards electrophilic aromatic substitution. So we're really looking at how electron rich each one of these is making the benzene ring. Yeah. Right? Last, one, the activator, it's Last ones, those are that's hyperconjugation. That's why it's an activator. But if there is another methyl alpha, it'd be a deactivator. Nope, it still be it still would be an activator. Right? It's all about the sig It's all about hyperconjugation there. So it's not about benzylic H's or anything. It's just if there's sigma bonds off here or just bonds off here that just carbons, then it's hyperconjugation that's helping to stabilize it. All right, so it's an activator. So the least so usually when I do these problems, I like to try to box it in, right? Either find the on either ends of the spectrum, right? So which one's gonna be the least reactive, which one's gonna be the most reactive. So which one here should be the least reactive? That should be the easiest one to find. The deactivator, the chlorine, right? So that'll be five. Right? <clears throat> Now, if, if we find the mo which one do you think is the most reactive? Benzene. The benzene's not. No. Nope. So the question is, I would look for, right, lone pairs, again, next to the ring, is always going to donate electron density, unless it's a halogen. Right, halogens are deactivators, because they deactivate through the sigma bond, but they also have lone pairs. But usually, if you have lone pairs, and they're next to the benzene ring, that's an activator. So, right, so that, I wouldn't, there's no lone pairs here, and this is kind of the neutral spot. So it's between this ester kind of thing and the phenol. Now, how do we differentiate between those two? The phenol is more activating, but why? Because um, it, can, it contributes resonance only in one direction rather than the other one. Right, so notice, right, phenol can only donate electrons towards the ring. Whereas this ester, right, we could also do resonance structures going back towards the carbonyl. Right, so this is actually going to be more reactive. So this is going to be the most reactive one. Now, lone pairs are better than hyperconjugation. So this is actually still number two. And then this would be three, because any group is better than just a hydrogen. <coughs> Take a look at using uh, a Grignard uh, and how to make that. So we make those from alkyl bromides. So bromine attached to a carbon, right? Remember this is that umplon chemistry, right? Where we basically take something that was an electrophile and turn it into a nucleophile. So we're looking at this carbon here. This carbon is pretty delta plus when it's bonded to bromine, right? It's pretty electrophilic. It's electron deficient. But what metals can do, specifically Grignards, when we add in magnesium, zero, like literally magnesium metal, Right? We can turn what was a delta plus into a, a delta minus, or an electron-rich site. So what happens here, the product looks like this. Or also the magnesium has jumped in between that bond, and now it's magnesium 2, or you can even say just 2 plus. So this comes back to that thing we always kind of talk about, where, how, many, how many electrons in a bond? 
Oh, it's two electrons in a bond. So there are two electrons here, but also over here we have a new bond. So who gave up the electrons? The magnesium did. The magnesium was oxidized. But what happened when this? Ha what happened because of this? Right? Metals are pretty delta plus. Right? All of a sudden, this carbon that was delta plus becomes delta minus and a good nucleophile. Right? So it turned this carbon from an electrophile into a nucleophile. Are those aromatic rings? This is not an aromatic ring. I didn't draw it on an aromatic ring this time. I just did a cyclohex cyclohexyl bromate bromine. It, it could be, bromine could be attached to lots of different things. It doesn't matter where the bromine is attached, just attached to a carbon. Yep, you're going to go from an electrophile to a nucleophile. The magnesium is the one that gives up those electrons. Yeah. You can just draw this. I mean, if you wanted, we could, we could think of the mechanism. I could show it to you. Right, it's pretty easy to think about. It's a fish hook kind of thing. It's not too complicated. But just have it jump in there and lose two electrons. Right, so now this is nice because now we've created a carbon nucleophile and we've talked about ways to use nucleophiles in substitution reactions. Right, so an example could be we could take this alkyl bromide and now react it with the new Grignard reagent we just made. Right. So now we have an electrophile and a nucleophile. We number our carbons, one, two, we'll call this one, three. So the new bond between what two carbons? One and three. So the electrons in this bond, right, do the backside attack into sigma star. Take out the bromine. This is just like substitution, right? We just changed, instead of using OH minus, I've used the Grignard for substitution. I did this one in class. It's really important to number your carbons here because people will invariably try to lose one or gain one. Right? And what else is left behind to balance our charge? We should have left behind, there should be a magnesium bromide, the plus charge, and a Br minus. Right? You can see this magnesium lost electrons as they went over here. This bromine got electrons. And then these guys could actually form, come together again and form a salt. But you get a new substituted product and form a new carbon-carbon bond with this Grignard. This is the reaction, that's the sigma star, right? So we're talking about substituting. So if this is a carbon-bromine bond, right? In the bonding orbital, where are the electrons at? The carbon or the bromine? bromine. The bromine. So in the antibonding orbital, where are the electrons not at? The carbon, right? So they'd be back over here. We know where that, that space is. Right? If you put electrons in someone's antibonding orbital, you break the bonding orbital. That's important because we know it's back here, 180 degrees away, so it only works right. This bromine right here is what kind of bromine? It's on what kind of carbon? It's on a primary carbon, so it's not, there's not much other stuff around here, right? It's easy for the nucleophile to get back here. If this bromine was more substituted, if it was on a tertiary carbon, we wouldn't be able to do substitution. We'd have to probably do elimination instead. All right, this is number 13. On exam one from 2004, teen. Yeah, I was in college. Uh, and the question is, how do you go from benzene to this? F, one, two, three. Okay, so. You need to add three substituents out of a benzene. And so the first thing you want to do is let's analyze the substituents and what we know about them. So if I circle this one, I'll call it A, B, C. Okay, so for A, we know it's an activator, hopefully. Right? And all activators direct where? Ortho and para. Now, what else can we perceive from this. We should be able to take even more of a, a jump here. So we're making a carbon-carbon bond onto a benzene ring. We only know two ways to do that, right? Either Friedel Crafts alkylation or Friedel Crafts acylation. This can only work one way. To put A on, what way does it have to be? 
Can it be acylation ever? No. So we know it has to come on by alkylation. Right? So it came on by... Right, we know it had to be FC alkylation. Right? We know that's the only way it could have got on. What about B? Activator or deactivator? Deactivator. Which way does it direct? Ortho and para, right? Fluorine still has lone pairs, so it's still directing ortho and para, but it's overall a deactivator. How many ways do you know how to put fluorine on? Just one, and how did you have to do that? Yeah. Not hydro, no, so you, you go through this, so you have to go through the diazonium salt, and then you just use an F minus, oh. right? So we got it, we know we're gonna have to go through something like this, right? Yeah, I'm not asking you to know, right? I want you to know those six ways, and I'm not asking you to know those specific reagents. I know that in the book is probably HBF4, yeah. but you can just say F minus, okay. right? But you know you have to go through a diazonium salt to add a fluorine, that's the only way you know how to add fluorine. Right? I showed you halogenation with bromine and chlorine, but to get a fluorine and iodine on, you're going to need to use the diazonium salts. You need to go through the N2+. Plus. Okay? So far, so good. What about C? So C is an activator or deactivator? And all activators direct? Ortho, para. Now again, it's carbon-carbon bond. We only know how to make two ways to make carbon-carbon bonds on benzene rings. So this is either alkylation or acylation, but it's only one. Which one does it have to be? Acylation. It has to be acylation because it's a straight chain, right? And only acylations do not go through carbocations to get a straight chain like this. So we know it's FC acylation, right? So this helps us a lot. Just in that initial analysis right here, we know... Right? A lot here. You know exactly how things have to go. Right? And so we probably know the last thing we want to put on, hopefully, too. Let's talk about the relationship to each other. So we got A and B are ortho to each other, obviously. But if you looked at and B is ortho and, and meta to C. And so that you can look at all their relationships to each other as well. So again, if we're thinking about this, one of the last things we probably, probably want to put on is the deactivator. And we know that, right, we know that the fluorine, the only way for the fluorine to get on is through this diazonium salt. That's probably the most logical one step back, is right. We usually want to put that fluorine or that N2 plus is like the last thing we do towards the end. So we take one step back. We would have... Right? Back to the diazonium salt. Okay. And one step back from the diazonium salt will be what? The NH2. There. Now we have some choices to make. What we can think about. Well, where does the NH2 come from? Well, we could e so we could either so this this is the this is the point I was trying to make. So if I do it a different way, that's on then it's on the key. Let me see the key again. The way I did it. So this there's always these problems. There is and there can be more than one way to do this. So maybe I'll show you a different way than on the key here. If everybody's okay. There's more. This would be just as fine as the other one. All right. Okay. So one step back, I'm actually, in the key, I said I'm going to make NO2. But I'm, instead, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that NH2 can do, is a, an activating group. Let's do a 
acylation or alkylation. Right, let's put an al let's do an al acyl alkylation at this point. So let's say one step back would be right. And which alkyl group should I take off? A or A or C? Which one makes the most sense? A or C? A. Has to be A because what kind of NH two now is an activator and it directs ortho and para, and A is ortho to it, whereas C is meta. So it makes more sense to take off A. Push everything up. There we are. Now one step back from this would be NO2, like that. Now these two things are meta to each other, right? So which one, right now, this is an activator, this is a deactivator, but was this always a activator? And we know NO2 is probably not something you want to use to direct something, right? It's pretty deactivating. So we take one step back. That could have came from... Why is NO2 deactivated? What's this Lewis dot structure look like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Draw Lewis... So the Lewis dot structure for NO2 is a plus charge of the nitrogen, yep. And that put the NO2 on. And I think from this point, you should know the order, I, I hope. So you put the acylation first, then you put the NO2 on. And then you could do H2 plium on carbon and do two steps at once. All right? You could do H2 plium on carbon, which is at this point, right? if I use H2 plium on carbon... I would reduce this and reduce this, and I'd go right to here. I could skip this whole step, right? Because H2 plium on carbon reduces benzylic carbonyls, but it also reduces nitros on benzene rings. All right, so if we're looking at the forward direction, the first step is going to be a Friedel-Crafts acylation of AlCl3. So that was like step one. Step two is going to have to be the nitration, HNO3, H2SO4. That gets us to this intermediate. Now we know there's how many ways to reduce benzylic carbonyls? Three, right? But we can take advantage of one of them and skip right ahead to here if we just do H2 plodium on carbon because that... Right, will reduce, it's not chlorine carbon, that will reduce benzoic carbonyls, and it will also reduce the NO2. And I think zinc HCl, will, the Clemenson will also do this. Right, it will get a two for one here. Right, Clemenson will also reduce the NO2. The zinc HCl will as well. Wolf Kishner, right, it's only going to get this, but you can just have two steps. Okay. From here, Friedel-Crafts ace or alkylation, similar to what we did in lab. FeCl3, why not? Now this could be a problem, right? People could say, I don't know. This is this is pretty big. It could go para too, but maybe this is yeah, you're comparing. The NH2 versus alkyl group is probably going to go ortho. Right? And some of this stuff, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Right? So if I'm telling you to make this, I'm not, I'm not telling you to make something that's impossible. Right? So if you have to take some liberties and say, hey, I might also get some of the product here, it's okay. I'll pretend that we get, you can get it to work on paper. Right? And then at that point, what do we need to do? I'm looping back around here. We need Na, NO2, HCl. Right, that turns the NH2 into the N2 plus. 
And then the final step is essentially just adding in, you can just even just write F minus to switch it out. All right, let's look at an acid base question that says, wants us to rank the order of acidity for these molecules. So, let me draw these. They're phenol derivatives. They're all OHs. All right, so they're all phenols, and they all, and two of them have nitriles on them. All right, and so to rank the acidity, so least acidic to most acidic. So again, what are we talking about when we say acidity? What specifically are we talking about in this case? Which bond? The polar bonds to hydrogen. In this case, specifically, which one? The OH bond in all of these. So we want the H to be as delta plus as possible, right? So we want to pull away electron density from it. So the question is, which one of these does that most efficiently? All right, so let's look at, so what's the same? The OH is all the same on all of them, so that's nothing different. This, this is just phenol. It has no other substituents. So is it, going to be, is it going to have, so there's nothing else going on there. And these two have nitrile. So what is nitrile? Is nitrile an electron drawing or an electron donating group? It's an electron withdrawing group, right? This carbon is pretty delta plus, right? It's triple bonded to nitrogen. So, do electron withdrawing groups make something a better acid if it's on the ring or make it a worse acid? Better. Makes it more reactive, right? Because it's pulling, like, electron withdrawing groups pull away electrons through the bonds, right? So the least acidic, for sure, is going to be which one? If I labeled these A, B, and C, right, the least acidic it's for sure A. Easy. All right. Okay. How are we going to differentiate between B and C? We're going to have to do some resonance structures. Right? And so what we talked about, right, usually, in any, well, not usually, in any reaction, either we have reactive starting materials and or stable products. So in this case, one of these nitriles is going to have a larger effect than the other because this one's meta to the OH and this one's para. And you should be able to see that by resonance structures. Right? So essentially the question is which one of these, what they're, where they're located, is going to have more resonance structures that affect that OH. So if we draw lone pairs on the oxygen, obviously there's two, but we draw one if we can push those electrons all the way towards that nitrile and get the, and move the electrons in the nitrile, that's going to be, what's that going to do to the OH bond? It's going to make it much more polar, right, in a weaker bond. All right, so let's try. So if I start moving electrons here, move those there, move these here, let's see what I got. Yeah, plus charge on oxygen now. Pi bond there, negative charge here, still a pi bond there, and here's my nitro. So I just stopped at this point. But is there any way I can get these electrons, these two electrons, this negative charge, into that nitro? Is it possible? Everybody see how it's not possible to do that? Right, I could push these electrons here, but then I would just break that pi bond and go there. Right? I can't push them, and then I'd have to break this bond. That doesn't make any sense. All right, so see how when the nitrile is in the meta position, I can't do anything to get those electrons to dump into this nitrile. But what if it's para? Well, let's try that. Do the same arrows. <coughs> Except now, oh. Looks like I was able to dump electrons into that nitro. Let's see what this looks like. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 
There we go. So there's two resonance structures. Which resonance structure do you like better? The one from B or the one from C? Why do you like the one from C better? Say it again. N's more electronegative, and in C, what? N has a negative charge. Right? So this is a this is a more likely resonance structure than this one. And what does this resonance structure show us? So if this is a resonance structure is likely, in this resonance structure, what happens to the H? All of a sudden, this bond becomes much more much weaker because there's right electrons have been pulled away more efficiently. So that makes this more acidic because of the resonance form. Right? Any electron drawing group makes it more acidic. But if there's a resonance form where the electrons can directly get put into that electron drawing group, that's even better. Do you see that? Kind of how that works? All right, both of these resonance forms, right, there's a plus charge in the oxygen, but really the plus charge, really the, the electron deficiency is where? Hopefully you see it on the hydrogens, right? So this part looks the same, right? So then we say, well, what's different now again, right? Just like we asked that question up here. We said, well, these two have electron drawing groups. This one doesn't, so this one's not going to be acidic. So now we look at these. Well, these are the same, but one's meta, one's para. So we do a resonance structure, and we say, well, this is the same. Both of these look like this is going to make this really acidic. So then we say, well, which one of these resonance structures is more likely to happen? And that comes down to, right, chapter one, electronegativity. A carbon with a negative charge or a nitrogen with a negative charge? Which one are you guys cooler with? Nitrogen. The nitrogen. Is it always going to be para? Para and ortho will always do this. But you know, I'm not going to ask that. Right? <laughs> That's why I haven't said it yet. Well, I did now, didn't I? But we've discovered this now without having me just to tell you, right? So it's not just enough to know. I want you to prove it to me. Right? Just like I, I have to prove it to you. All right, so that's a good point. This is really important. Let's look at, let's, let's go ahead and number carbons here. One, two, three, four, five, six, and I'll call this one seven. So why can't in B these electrons get to seven? But first, right, you have to be right next to each other, right? When I did this, for, when I first moved electrons from here, right, these electrons went right there. I can't skip over. Right, so if I, even if I move this electrons here, the only place I can move these electrons are either between 4 and 3 or between 5 and 4. That's the only place I can move them. But if you look at carbon 3, how many bonds does carbon 3 have right now? It's 4. So if I move electrons towards carbon 3, what do I need to do? I better break a bond. So either I can move electrons in the pi bond to 2, or I could just break 3 and 7 and kick that out. Right, see, I can't get to 7 from 4. Not in one step, right? Three already has four bonds, just like five already has four bonds. Does that make, do you see that now? Right? I could, I could push these electrons here, but then I would have to kick out, I have to break three and seven. Yeah, so you have the potential to kick out that one. So yeah, that I yeah. could, mm. but that wouldn't be, that's not going to make me more acidic, right? Because now I just made CN minus. So that's not good. You don't want to do that either. So that's not, well, it certainly leads to the fact that I won't be more acidic. Make sense? That's a hard one to see. This is like the classic one, people. Because people, I challenge you to try to draw it yourself. Prove it to yourself. Because people will look at this and be like, okay. And then they'll get the test and we'll have... Even if I move the electrons between... Right, so think about this. If I move the electrons between 4 and 3 and kicked out that CN minus, what's that going to look like? It'll look, right, so I'm going to do it. But this is bad, Just, but I'm doing it. So if I move those electrons there, and I break that, what's this going to look like? Weird. It's going to look weird. Right, I didn't do anything wrong with my electrons, right? And what do I, I always want to balance my charge. So let's draw the part we know. And where's our new pi bond at? Right there. Right, and then we have this. With the minus, right, to balance our charge, our carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And 
If you look between two, three, and four, is that so? What would the hybridization state of three be right now? How many pi bonds does three have? Sp. What's the bond angle for an sp hybridized carbon? 180. In a six-membered ring, think we could build that one? Probably not going to work, right? So, right, another reason, right, but this is good. You draw that out, you're like, oh, my God, what have I done? And then you realize, okay, right, it can't go that way. So hopefully we see that that's bad news, right? But until you draw it, you don't realize really how bad that looks, right? Okay. Right. So let's do a sigma complex question, trying to decide, right, instead of using resonance structures to decide where something directs, let's use sigma complexes to verify where something directs, right? So we've done it two ways, right? We can look at the starting materials, do some resonance structures, and say, okay, this carbon's electron rich. It's going to be the nucleophile. It's going to add, electrophiles are going to add an ortho. Now let's do a sigma complex and say, okay, we've already added it. Can we make really stable sigma complexes? This comes back to exactly what we did in lab, right? You calculated three different possible sigma complexes and saw which one had the lowest energy of formation. Right, so the same idea. So in this case, I'll make it a little clear. Let's go with let's go with anisole. All right, and let's have some options here. Let's add. We'll add E plus, E plus, and the top one we'll do. You want to do ortho or para? Ortho. Ortho it is, and then the other one we're going to add. Meta. Now, you should know the answer going into this, which one's going to be better. You just need to prove it. Right? So, anisole, this ether, is this an activator or a deactivator? Activator. Activators always direct where? Ortho para. Ortho para. So, you know that ortho is going to be better. You don't know if it's going to, you're not, you're not sure if it has a four sigma complex, but actually you should be sure because if it has lone pairs, you're going to be able to make the four sigma complex if you add things ortho and para, right? So if it has lone pairs and you add things ortho and para, you can get the four sigma complex, right? So that's the, that's how you know things want to add ortho and para with electron donating groups, right? So you know this should work out better for you. So you see the lone pairs, you know it's an activator, right? You don't want to go ortho and para, right? You should get a four sigma complex. But you're going to draw the meta ones out just as, as well to, pr to prove to yourself that they're not as good as well. All right, so let's go through this. So if I number the carbons, let's just number them one and two here. So for the top one, the electrophile is going to go on which carbon? What's the meta position here? That's an ortho. Oh, ortho, so it should go where? Carbon one. And the plus charge goes on carbon two. That's our first sigma complex. Move the pi bond. Electrophile. Get to another sigma complex. Move another pi bond. get to another sigma complex. But now, the plus charge is right next to that lone pair that's on the oxygen, right? So then these electrons can go down there. And now you have a four sigma complex. All right, so the key is lone pairs next to the ring. All right. But are, do all activators have lone pairs? No, because, right, alkyl groups are activators, they don't have lone pairs. And just because you have lone pairs, does that mean you're an activator? No, because fluorine, bromine, chlorine, and iodine are, are deactivators, but they have lone pairs. 
So between these four sigma complexes, so we know that's good, right? That, which makes sense because we know activators add ortho para. Which one's the best? A, B, C, or D? 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 D. D. For love, for the love of lo the Lord. What is the first rule of Lewis dot structures? Nope, that is not. The first rule is not the lying part. The octet rule. For the octet rule. Octets, octets, octets. Which, of course, means eight electrons around you. Which one of these has full octet? O one. <laughs> Only D. Carbocations do not have full octets. Who cares that oxygen has a plus charge? That's the second rule. Lewis dot structures lie. The first thing is octet rule. That's the, by far the most important thing. Always the octet rule. Octets, 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 octet rule, octet rule, octet rule, octet rule. Octet rule. You remember this tomorrow. Octet rule. What is the most important rule? What is the first rule of Lewis dot structures? The octet rule. The funnest rule is that they lie, but that's not the most important one. Like most rule systems, the one you remember is not the one that matters the most. Okay, so we've thoroughly convinced what we already knew that it adds ortho because we have a fourth sigma complex. Yeah. Yay. Now, what if we added meta? Are we going to get anything so good as this? We will not. We will not. I hope not. We won't get anything bad, but we're not going to get anything great. So if we added meta, I don't think I can draw anymore. So it's only three. None of them have full octets. Why would you add meta if you can add ortho and get a fourth sigma complex that's super stable with full octets? So you won't. So the sigma complexes also show us that activators would rather go ortho and para. Right. So do the resonance forms, right? But be careful, sigma complexes are resonances, resonance forms of the intermediates. If I ask for the resonance form of the star material, that's different. That's different than the sigma complexes. Okay, let's say we're going to try to compare. We'll do, we'll do a couple things. We'll do the same starting material. Same star materials, but the first one we're going to react the Clemenson way, zinc HCl. And then in the other way, we'll do the Wolf Kishner. We'll do oops. We'll do OH minus and the H2 NN H2. I'm going to add another card right there. So in the top one, right, zinc HCl, we know for, in, for both these cases, if I draw this one in, we're going to reduce the benzylic carbonyl. That's going to happen. Right. The question is, is the zinc HCl going to do anything down here with this other functional group? Heck, I'm going to do something else, because I can. I'm going to add something on here. Boom. I'll throw an alkene on there, too. Why not? Because I can. Right. So, you have to look at this and say, what kind of functional groups do I have, and what kind of reagents do I have, and are they going to react? Right. So, we know zinc HCl for sure from this unit. 
reduces benzoyl carbonyls. So does the Wolf Kirchner. So this is acid, this is base. That's fine. Will HCl do anything with an alkyl bromide? No. no. So that part is not going to touch that. So we can draw that back in. Right? That part, that functional group in this molecule is not going to get changed. Now, what about HCl with an alkene? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's going to do something. That's going to add a chlorine. Well, so if we want that, that's great. But if we don't, we gotta, you know, worry about that. If we wanted to get rid of it, I guess we could add a bulky base and do an elimination, right? If we wanted to go backwards, right? We could still do it. So if you, yeah, you could do that. We can talk more about that in subsequent chapters. So what about if I just go down here? If I'm doing the Wolf Kirchner down, kind of down this area. Same first step. We know the carbonyl is going to be gone, right? We can all agree on that. Wolf, -Kish Wolf Kishner reduces benzoyl carbonyls. Does the OH minus do anything with an alkene? There's actually a couple ways to think about this. So, an alkene, if you've seen that act as what? Has that always been an electrophile or a nucleophile to you guys? Nucleophile. Well, OH minus, is that electron rich or electron poor? And nucleophiles are electron rich. Do two nucleophiles ever react? No. no. Right? But now if you go down here and look at this carbon bromine, that carbon of the bromine is pretty delta plus, right? And probably things around the bromine are going to be pretty delta plus. So that's more of an electrophile type thing. Bromine's and oh, delta minus. Bromine is delta minus, okay. but the things around bromine are delta plus, right? We think of those as electrophil electrophiles. So OH- is a nucleophile, so it's more likely to interact with the delta plus part. Yeah. Right? And you can think about this last one where we did the Clemenson, HCl, that's an acid. Acids are electrophiles or nucleophiles. Electrophiles, well, this is an electron-rich part. That makes sense that those two things would interact. Right? So what's, what's this OH- minus in this case going to do with this alkyl halide? So this alkyl halide is a tertiary alkyl halide. Right, so alkyl halides, we can either do substitutions or eliminations. Right, and we talked about substitutions will work really well if it's easy to get to sigma star. That's usually only primary alkyl halides. This is a tertiary alkyl halide. So we can't do substitutions. There's too much junk going on here. So we need to do an elimination instead. So we're going to take off the H and lose the bromine and do an elimination instead. So the pi bonds stay in put. Nothing's changing there. Notice the elimination. You took the H that's two bonds away from that carbon. We also made Br minus in water. All right, so because it's a tertiary alkyl halide, we'll do an elimination. Primary, we would primary alkyl halide, we would have done a substitution. Secondary? secondary is a mess. We, there's more factors we have to take into account than with secondary. Don't worry about secondary. Don't worry about secondary yet. Nope, don't worry about it. Yes. Next, next unit, we're going to be worrying about that.